Hello and welcome back to Rage Gaming and Baldur's Gate 3. With the early access we've been given thanks to Larian Studios, we've been playing the game for a little while now. And with my experience playing that full release, I wanted to make a useful video for the new players jumping in for the first time. Just Act 1 has this insane amount of options when it comes to personal story experience, sure, but also how you're going to interact with the world. The characters, the party, who you bring and why, how you equip them, what spells and upgrades, what feats and abilities, specific items in set locations, specific concepts, abilities and spells, knowing them all and having them all can make a difference. This video then is a spoiler free guide to gaining power and quick in your opening days of Act 1. As we begin though, I'll start with the most relevant to you from the moment you begin playing and progress from there. So first up, with your introduction to the game, you begin on that Nautiloid ship. At the end of the intro, you find a Mind Flayer fighting a big demon commander. You're told to ignore this fight and just go complete the objective, but if you instead fight and defeat Commander Zelk, not only does he provide some nice XP, but more importantly, a green weapon drop. The Everburn Blade is a two-handed sword with fire damage. It comes with the Pommel Strike ability, meaning you can use an attack with a two-hand weapon with a bonus action, which is really good. But if you missed that, don't worry. There's another arguably better weapon I'll mention shortly that fills the same role. Now you've escaped the ship, you're actually going to have some levels to consider. Each level, you'll get some passive bonuses like more health and new abilities, maybe as a choice. What spells should you pick? What actions? What abilities? What passives? I won't spend forever talking about every class and every spell. I'm just going to give you concepts. I would recommend instant kill options or control options. Instant kill means knockback, such as knocking enemies so far they die or fall into a deadly situation or fade to black because that's a death pit. This spell, Thunder Wave, can AOE push enemies and so it's perfect. Stronger enemies might resist but it is an incredible way to deal with groups of enemies or particularly strong enemies in a very strong way. Meanwhile, control options are impactful ways to prevent the enemy from dealing full damage or any damage to you. You could sleep an enemy or trap them with a whole person spell, try to knock them down or off balance, you could try to disarm them, fear them, and so on. Pick options that provide this type of utility and make the most of them. These tricks can turn a fight that you have no business winning into a victory. Naturally, make sure you're taking options that do have high damage as always, but there quickly comes a point where you have the strong abilities you're going to use, now you need some utility and that comes fast. Next in priority is the main story power, Illithid powers. As you can see, I happen to have three unspent points and we can take a look at a brain map. Like spending talents in a talent tree, you can pick options and then unlock further options. These powers can be insanely good, such as the passive favorable beginners feature or look of the far realms. Some of these aren't all positive though, like Cernic Overload. You can deal some psychic damage, but take some every turn. You'll also know that you can mess with this for your companions, but as you can see, some aren't exactly willing to do it immediately or at all. Despite the fact that some of these upgrades are insanely powerful, you want to think about this from a story perspective as well. Not all benefits are strictly positive as we looked at, and it may affect the story and how much you lean into this suspicious and dangerous power. It is your choice to make. However, you'll need to collect illithids to actually get these upgrades. This could be from combat by killing a named mob that has their own mind worm, and after you kill them, you can just loot it. Now you have the point spent. Or you can find parasite specimens throughout the story and in the open world. For example, the druids, they have one in their base. It's just in a jar that you can pick up and hey, now you have an extra point to spend. So be on the lookout for them and intentionally use them or don't based on your preferences. Speaking on party members, we have your companions. Teammates aren't all made equal, especially in the very early game. It's a fact that rogues and their stealth ability is super impactful. It'll lead to a surprise attack by stealthing up to enemies to start a fight on your terms. And actually, surprise enemies can miss their full first turn, which can be a major advantage in combat. That's why Asterion is obviously a really good starting companion. You get him on the beach where you land immediately, and he is so good even in the mid to late game as well as early game. As a character, he has plus three perception, which is incredible for revealing secrets, and more importantly, traps to avoid or disarm. He's He's undeniably so useful, especially in the early game. I would say the best. Second to that would be the other character you get immediately at the start of the game, Shadow Heart, and they give you them immediately for a good reason. She works as an effective buff and heal bot in the early game, quite impactful too. These two I would strongly recommend and that's why they give you them immediately. But you might change the party to suit you and your plans to a more personal level. Maybe you're playing a rogue and having two rogues in one party isn't really as useful as bringing something else. It really depends on your setup. You can get yourself way more than just the starting options quickly though, and we have a video coming out tomorrow about 
all the Act 1 companions, where they are and how to get them, and what makes each one good. Now that's explained, let's finally get into the raw details of loot. In general, you want to pick up and loot everything. This is because no matter how much junk you end up picking up, you can always right click it and choose send to camp and that will send it individually to the massive container chest that it's in your camp. At any time you can just go to your camp and go check on that massive chest. What's great about this is it means you're not lugging this stuff around all the time which does weigh you down and you don't want that and the fact is you will find some incredible items in random chests and barrels. Most often you'll find tons of food which is important because you need food for long rests which you'll be doing a lot more than you might originally think. But there's again Again, impressive items of power in chests, the hidden rooms, the trap rooms, and so on. So you want to always be checking everything, especially chests. Even if you are picking up loads of random junk, it can be valuable, because by the time you actually find a vendor, you'll have a hoard of things in your camp chest to sell. You can just teleport back to the camp, grab everything you plan to sell, get it in your inventory, teleport back, and sell massive amounts of items. Even things that worth, say, three gold individually, well, if you sell a hundred of them, that's a lot of gold. In the early game, this genuinely leads to getting your first few hundred and quickly thousands of gold and that means you can then buy equipment. I would recommend everyone in the party has at least a green weapon because you'll have a weapon enchantment. Weapon enchantments as you can see means the weapon receives a plus one bonus to attack rolls and deals one bonus damage. That compared to well a plus zero is major. As you can see magic items can be really impactful whether it's green or blue or whatever. Blues often provide unique passives such as the speedy sparks. When the wearer dashes or takes a similar action during combat they gain three lightning charges meaning you start to get lightning damage on your attacks. Take the spider silk armor here. Gain a plus one bonus to stealth checks, which is incredible, especially on a rogue character like this. Or the line breaker boots, giving you adrenaline rush. When you dash, you gain wrath for two turns. Insane on a rogue character who is dashing all the time. These, of course, change the way you approach combat and are tied to the builds you'll make long term. However, in the early days, you can have a very limited supply of these to find and unlock, but they will make a strong difference the sooner you have them rather than later. There are some in set locations I can just tell you about. Starting here in the Blighted Village where you're able to find an absolute pile of them in your very early days. The Blighted Village is essentially in the center of the map, northwest of where you begin at the overgrown ruins. You can make your way over here and cross the bridge and then you'll come to the Blighted Village. Be warned that there are goblins on this roof and this roof that will ambush you if you're not careful. Once you've made the area safe though, you want to go to the shabby wooden doors, which upon entry is essentially the right building here where there's a bloodstain and you can enter here. Upon entering you'll be in a cellar and you can make your way down and there's a chest up here that you can open. In that chest you'll find this item, the steel forged sword, which gives you yeah a weapon enchantment but also 5 to 10 damage in the early game to get you going. This weapon also provides the flourish ability which possibly throws your enemy off balance which is one of those ways to control an enemy and gain more advantage in a fight. This is exactly the type of thing that having versus not having makes a major difference in the early days. Also down here is a secret next to the forge, a wall you can break which reveals a whole new area. From the basement then we can head west to the center of the blighted village where you will see a moss covered chest. If you can get this open you'll be able to get another item but this time it'll be a blue. The haste helm is awesome. The start of combat the wearer gains momentum for three turns. This essentially increases the movement distance you can take during the time you have this buff which is the first three turns. Incredible on say a melee character to get them in position at the start of a fight. From here we can head uphill onto the west further to find a windmill and if you go around the windmill you can see there's a trap door leading to another basement. By entering that basement we have another chest hidden away with more loot inside of it. In here we have the speedy light feet boots. This is what provides speedy sparks meaning when we dash we get lightning charges getting lightning damage on our attacks as well as that level to athletics. We have just one more item that's amazing that we can get while we're here if you head from the windmill to the north and you can use a jump to get over the wall that prevents you from going that way quickly. Continue north and you will find this hill with some meat cooking on it. This meat has a dagger lodged inside of it and if you can free the dagger from this meat which is quite a strange task you'll get a dagger plus one. It's not exactly overly exciting, but it is a dagger that has a weapon enchantment on it. Again, great for a rogue or anyone that can use them. Having plus one bonus to attack rolls and dealing plus one damage versus not is obviously great. 
Next, we have another pair of gloves. In this case, the green gloves of power, which with absolute Spain on melee hit, you might cause a minus D4 penalty to a target's attack roll and saving rolls, as well as getting sleight of hand. As you can see, you can also have it blessed to improve the power of these gloves. To get them, you'll need to come here, which is just in front of the Emerald Grove entrance. When you first get here, there will be a goblin assault happening and the leader of that goblin assault has those gloves on him. So defeat them and take the gloves. By heading west of here, past the Blighted Village, you will find the Goblin Camp. And if you make your way in here smoothly without getting into combat, you can go speak to the Priestess Gur and have her give you a mark, which will enhance the power of those gloves. This is also great because you don't have to story-wise make a choice to go with or against the goblins to get this mark and get the power up. Lastly, I did mention another powerful two-hand sword option, arguably, of course, much better than the one that we could have grabbed in the starting section. This is the Sword of Justice, and it has 6 to 16 damage, has the weapon enchantment plus one, and comes with a unique ability, Tears Protection. Using this ability, you can protect a creature, such as one of your allies or yourself, and increase its armor class by two, all the way until a long rest, which is a major buff. To use this, it's just an ability that appears on your bars, and then you can click on yourself or an ally, and there you go, now you've got that blessing. It is a two-hand greatsword though, so it comes with Pommel Strike, that brilliant bonus action attack of a two-hand sword. Then we have Lacerate, which will give you a bleed over time, and Cleave, which is an AoE. This weapon is brilliant in the early days of Act 1. To get it, you'll need to come to the North point of the map just by the Risen Road waypoint. There is a sort of inn here. By entering it you'll meet some paladins who seem a bit strange and suspicious. Anders is the one that holds the sword in question and when you speak to him they'll ask you to go defeat a nearby companion character Karlak. Anders promises to give you the sword if you do that. Or you can side with Karlak herself, defeat the apparent paladins and take the sword from Anders that way. If you are looking to collect all party members, or want Karlak in particular, well you're gonna want to help her and I would probably recommend you do that. So now we have a selection of awesome items that you can equip how you want. Making sure you give these items to the people who will most benefit from them is obviously an important aspect of this. If you pile all your power onto one character, you're not really going to get the most out of it. What if that character gets CC'd or dies temporarily or gets knocked down or anything? It'll be up to you to work out what's going to be most useful to each individual character. And when it comes to unique passives, you'll have to think about who's going to get the most consistent benefit of that buff, such as a rogue gaining wrath whenever they dash. And since rogues use a bonus action to dash rather than a full action, they're dashing the most of all. So this just makes sense. Then when it comes to consumables, I strongly recommend you find vendors and buy some potions of healing, especially stronger potions of healing as we get going. What's important about this when it comes to consumables is making sure that you spread them out amongst your party. For example, my paladin has 11 potions of healing and my character Gale has none. So in the middle of a fight, when Gale tries to drink a potion, he's going to find that he in his individual inventory, well, he has none. So of course he can't use one. I know this might seem obvious, but it's something that's happened to me in combat in the early days. And it's one thing that I want to highlight here. So make sure that individually everyone has some potions and some stronger ones should they need it. But beyond that, you can see how I've spread out the inventory a little bit more. For example, Gale is able to make use of magical scrolls and use them as a single use item. That's much better for him to have it if he can actually use it versus someone that can't. Asterion uses a bow, so it's better that he has the arrows that have special properties to make the most use of them. There's also oils that you can coat your weapon with. There's no point someone like Gale, who's using his staff basically never, to empower his melee weapon. So that should be on your melee fighters to use it when they need to. It's just funny, there's that classic RPG player who saves their strong things for when they need it. And then they complete the game and they've never used a single magical scroll or oil or anything at any point. Try to avoid being that person. Organize your inventory, give the things that matter to the people who can actually use them, and then use them. You'll find tons of them. You'll be able to buy tons of them. You'll get given loads of them. And they can really change a battle and make you much more efficient or be able to deal with a harder combat situation. So use them. One more thing I want to mention is feats. At class levels 4, 8, and 12, you unlock these feats for a class. It's a long list of options that can be strong passives that change the way you approach combat. For example, my paladin has sentinel now. So whenever an ally is attacked, if my paladin's in melee range, I just get to hit them for free, which is incredible and changes the way I position my paladin entirely in fights. This is a major power spike from the moment that I got it and when I use it well. The other option is to take an ability score improvement instead. This lets you increase an ability score by 
two or two ability scores by one. Be aware that ability scores and their modifiers are actually relevant to set levels, meaning every two levels generally will increase the modifier by one. So level 16 to 17 strength is going to give the same modifier, whereas 18 and 19 will provide a higher one. Therefore, ability score improvement can be well worth it if you're pushing your stats that are askew. If you have a stat that's level 13 or 17 or 19 or 21, it's better that that stat is 22 or one level higher generally. So it's even and you actually get a modifier. But there you have it. Those are some basic and relatively spoiler free as much as possible concepts and ideas to keep in mind, as well as the literal locations of some strong items in the early game. I do hope this video has helped you. But for now, I've been Hollow. You've been you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice To reiterate that it is nice To look into your faces on a mostly daily basis When you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage Is, uh, goodbye